Hello and welcome to today's 15th webinar in the E360 webinar series, Understanding Leak Detection and Implementing Effective Programs, brought to you by Emerson Climate Technologies. I'm Alan Wisher and I'm your moderator today. We have a few announcements before we begin. Please note that this presentation's audio is not provided by phone number, but only through your computer's sound system, so be sure to turn up your computer's volume. You may ask an online question at any time throughout today's presentation by clicking on the question mark icon located in the floating toolbar at the edge of your screen. Simply type your question into the text area and hit send. Please keep the send to default set as all panelists. If you'd like to revisit key sections of today's webinar, it will be available on demand at emersonclimate, one word, dot com backslash E360 dash webinars, approximately 24 hours after this live event. You also receive an email in the next couple of days with a link to the recorded event. Now, on to the presentation, understanding leak detection and implementing effective programs. Discussing today's topic will be John Wallace, Director of Innovation, Retail Solutions, Emerson Climate Technologies. The webinar will now begin. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. I, I appreciate the introduction. Um, it's my pleasure to um, bring this um, webinar to you. I think it's a subject that uh, has broad interest, and uh, I'm glad we were able to put this on and offer the, uh, the information uh, to you. Hopefully, you'll find it uh, valuable. Uh, just a little bit of background. I know Alan introduced me, but um, I've spent um, over 20 years with Emerson in various roles in engineering, product management, uh, and I now lead a, a small group which is focused on uh, looking for and, and introducing new technologies um, as part of our retail solutions group. Um, one of the things that I, I know I, I was privy to the attendee list um, that uh, is published uh, and sent before the webinars, and I know that we have a lot of people on the, the webinar today, and there's a pretty broad range of, uh, of expertise. Some people are very familiar, some people uh, maybe not so familiar. So one of the things I'm going to do is, uh, during the presentation is try to provide a background uh, and a little bit of a re review. So for some people, it may be a little bit uh, of a review. For others, it uh, will probably be new information. So I ask your patience as we uh, as we go through that. Uh, the other thing I'd like to say before we start, too, is that um, I've, um, as I've done research for this uh, presentation, I've accumulated lots of references and additional info, and I've tried to include those uh, in the presentation. So you're going to see footnotes on the slides that relate directly, uh, generally websites uh, that I've found very valuable. And then I've also summarized those at the end of the presentation as well. There's a summary slide. So uh, you don't need to be taking notes or necessarily anything like that uh, uh, as the presentation will be available. But I would certainly encourage you to use those references um, and dig into the information for yourself. Uh, the last thing I wanted to tell you is we'll be doing a series of, of uh, questions through the presentation just to kind of a get to know you a little bit better. Um, so what we'll do is uh, you'll see the poll question on the screen as a slide. Uh, I'll introduce it, and then I'll ask you to take um, just a few seconds and submit your answers. Uh, and then we'll have a pause uh, so we can collect all those answers up, and then we'll, we'll review the information together. So uh, it uh, should be kind of interesting. It provides some feedback and uh, uh, good information for us as we look at this topic overall. Um, so I've, um, I've structured the discussion today um, in, into four parts, um, as the, the agenda shows here. The first part is the introduction. And what I want to do is uh, give you some background. Uh, we'll talk about what um, a typical store looks like, a supermarket in this case. Um, and then we'll dive down a little bit more into what uh, the impact of refrigerant leaks are and also where you typically find those leaks. So we'll cover that in the first section. Um, then we're going to talk just a little bit about the regulatory environment. So we'll look at what the current regulations are in regards to uh, refrigerants and, and leaks, so refrigerant leaks and then also what some of the changes or the proposed changes um, have been uh, put out as well. We'll talk a bit about that. The next thing we'll do is talk about a leak detection program, and we'll, we'll uh, talk a bit about uh, some of the key elements there, some of the things that you should think about including if you're not already. And then finally, we'll wrap it up with um, 
with a look at uh, leak detection technologies. Um, we'll show you, uh, or I'll show you what's available, uh, some of the trade-offs associated with those, and, and also how you might use those as part of your uh, leak detection program. So with that, let's go ahead and start with the first one. Let's look at a little bit of background uh, here. And so what I've done is um, looked at, uh, pulled some information from uh, actually EPA, Green Chill, um, on what a typical store looks like. Now, it's a, it's a couple years old, um, so there may have been, you know, a few changes here and there, but I think uh, for the most part it's still pretty relevant. Um, and I, I called it a typical supermarket, and, and I do understand and realize there's, there's really no such thing as typical. I, I do a lot of those comparisons, and, you know, invariably somebody says, well, it doesn't match my circumstances, and you're absolutely right. There is, there is no such thing as typical, but I do think it's valuable to start with something um, and show some common understanding across that. So really, uh, for us, <clears throat> the key numbers here um, are kind of uh, up there at the top, the two to four racks per supermarket, um, the fact that there's over 100 display cases, um, over six, or typically right around 16 walk-in evaporators, uh, 404A, a, a refrigerant charge of about 3,500 pounds, plus or minus, something like that. And, yes, I understand there are different technologies that may change that number around a little bit, but, again, we're, we're trying to look at uh, typicals here. Um, and then uh, the, the thing that's, that's interesting, too, is that average leak rate that's there, 35%. Uh, and, again, I would encourage you to – you can look at the footnotes and uh, dig the information out for yourself. So, uh, so that 35%, if you just do the math on that, that means that there's a, a yearly uh, volume of refrigerant that's leaked uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 875 pounds. Now, there's been lots of attention over the last few years – uh, paid to reducing those leak rates. Um, I think the Green Shield program is a very good program, lots of information in there. I've used some of the information from Green Shield as part of the presentation. So I, I do know that, um, that there's some changes in that leak rate actually for Green Shield. Uh, partners is, is much lower. The latest I saw was somewhere in the neighborhood of maybe 12 to 13 percent. So it certainly is, is better, is much better. But then there's also a lot of the, uh, legacy uh, estates out there that, that aren't necessarily quite so good. So um, that average leak rate still is, is probably somewhere in the neighborhood of 20% or so. So when you look at um, all those pounds of refrigerant that, um, that we're talking about, that 875 pounds in the case of the last slide, what, what difference or what does it, what's the real impact of that? So this being um, an E360 seminar, I've tried to uh, – to think about and put that impact in terms of the, um, the elements of the E360, which are the economics, the environment, uh, energy, and also equipment. Um, I've, um, I've used some of the calculators, uh, again, that are listed on the, on the bottom there, the financial impact and then the, uh, uh, the climate impact calculators uh, from, from uh, EPA, from Green Chill, to, to do these calculations. And I've, um, I've based it on uh, some assumptions that are shown in the box at the top left-hand side there. Uh, I did choose a little bit lower leak rate, 20% leak rate uh, across a 100-store chain. Um, and when you do that calculation, I kept the 3,500 pounds. And when you do that calculation, it, uh, it looks like somewhere around 700 pounds per year would be, again, typical on average what you would be losing out of that site. Um, then I've also used just a, an, an average number of about $7 per pound for the 404A to do the, these calculations. So if you take those numbers and you run them through those financial impact calculators and, and the, uh, the other calculator that's shown there, you get the numbers that I've shown here. So up at the top, uh, under the economic impact, um, just for the refrigerant alone out of that is around um, 500000 so that's about half a million across that chain. 100 site chain, so that's uh, that's a pretty big deal. That's pretty major. Um, I, I suspect that's also probably uh, underestimated as well because I didn't really take into account any of the uh, labor charges or anything like that that would be associated with replacing that refrigerant. That is strictly the uh, the cost of the refrigerant itself. Now there's other um, other uh, economic impacts as well that are a little bit harder to quantify, but things like customer disruptions and satisfaction and things like that that could uh, go a long way, potentially even to damaging your brand if you're not very careful about that overall. 
So um, all in all, I think you know we can, we can all agree that there is a fairly significant economic impact when you look at uh, refrigerant leaks across the chain like that. Now around the climate impact side, and again this comes uh, out of the calculator that, that's listed down at the bo bottom there, uh, that same leak rate across that entire chain would be a little over 124,000 metric tons CO2 equivalent or right around 24,000 cars on the road, and, and the calculator uh, provides that uh, to you as well. So that's pretty major when I thought about that. Um, I, uh, you, know, you know, I know it, it's, um, it's very interesting to me to look at that and, and see those things, but again, those numbers to me are really speak volumes for what the impact of the leaks really are. Um, finally, depending upon the severity of the leak, um, you can certainly see an energy impact uh, and a potentially an equipment impact, too, because the equipment has to run harder and those kind of things. Those are a little bit harder to quantify, so I didn't really put numbers there, but they certainly do exist, uh, and I'm sure you, you would agree they, they do have an impact um, on your operations overall. Um, I guess the, the chief point or the big point of this slide is that leaks uh, do have a broad impact and they impact you in many different areas. So it's not just necessarily the cost of vision or the climate impact. There's a lot of tentacles that go out on uh, on those kind of on leaks like that. Uh, I would encourage you, uh, as I said, no site is typical, so I would definitely encourage you to uh, to grab those calculators and run your own numbers for your own site overall. So I guess the next logical question when you look at the impact that way is to say, well, where are all those leaks coming from? And so, again, I, I uh, referenced uh, an EPA uh, document uh, from a couple years ago. It was, uh, it's called Leak Prevention Guidelines and Repair Guidelines. And in that document, um, they surveyed a, uh, a, a regional chain, and they came up with numbers across that chain for where most of the leaks came from. And, and then they represented it um, in their document. I've converted it over to a little Pareto bar chart here to, to help me understand it just a little bit more. Um, and, you know, I, you, you probably say, well, maybe this doesn't represent my sites, and that's probably true, but I think um, – I think uh, the top offenders that are shown there, which in this case racks and cases and condensers, probably are common across most of the sites that you'll see just because of the mechanical constructions and things like that. Again, I understand, you know, your your mileage may vary, so to speak, but this provides a pretty good general direction of the areas that you want to focus on when you're looking to implement a program to reduce um, uh, leaks overall. You certainly don't want to ignore the rest of the, the units there, you know, uh, convincing units, remote handers, uh, walk-ins, et cetera, but you do want to uh, make sure that you're paying attention to those areas that have the highest probability uh, of, of having a leak. So um, I'd ask you to sort of remember this chart and, and think about it because it's going to become important as we talk about leak detection a little bit later where we are going to uh, ask some questions about, well, where should I be placing um, my sensors at, my sensing systems for, uh, for leak detection at? All right, and here is our first poll question. Um, and again, we're just using this to, uh, to try to uh, start a conversation and understand um, how familiar uh, you, the attendees, are with certain uh, elements. And in this case, uh, what I would like to know is, are you aware of the details of the EPA's proposal to update Section 608 um, of the Clean Air, Air Act. Um, it is either a yes or no question, and I would appreciate it if you'd go ahead and uh, submit your, your answers now. Um, and just uh, remember that you do need to click Submit after you select your answer so that it is registered by the system. Now, while we're waiting, it would probably be a good time for me to uh, provide you my disclaimer here. Um, there's uh, the, the, the regulations that we're talking about, uh, EPA and, and uh, CARB, the California Air Resources Board, are, are fairly complicated, um, and they have a lot of details in them. And, and I, I certainly am not um, uh, suggesting that I'm an expert in those areas, so I'm trying to provide some information to you and, and help, uh, help you understand but I would, um, I would advise you to, to look over the reference material that I've provided uh, as part of the presentation and really and draw your own conclusions, especially uh, seeking out legal help or maybe contacting EPA and CARB directly to, uh, to confirm the impact on the operations that you may have at your particular sites. So, um, so again, I uh, would just encourage you to spend a little more time uh, looking at those regulations and decide for yourself. 
So with that, uh, let's see if we have our results, and it looks like we do. You can view those results down uh, on the right-hand side there and, uh, and answer the question, are you aware of the details of the EPA's proposal to update? Uh, quite a large percentage, um, almost 70 percent, uh, have said no, and 30 percent have said yes. So um, that's actually uh, good good news for, for, for the presentation, I think, because hopefully after the presentation you'll have a little bit more information there and you would be able to offer or to answer that question is yes if we were to ask it again. So uh, so anyway, that's good to, good to know. Thanks for participating in the question. All right, so next we're going to talk about what those regulations or the proposed re and the proposed regulations are. And I, I thought I'd start with just um, a couple of uh, clippings that I, I pulled uh, from the EPA's in, enforcement page. Um, and again, the reference is shown down to the bottom there. But if you go look at their enforcement page, there are just lots and lots of stories uh, about enforcement actions that uh, the EPA has um, uh, acted upon over the last uh, several years. Um, I pulled a couple that you, you, know, you might be familiar with. It's from the industry, and you see some of the names there that, that you probably would recognize. I'm not you know, suggesting that, that uh, these companies are good or bad or anything necessarily. Just pulled them off of the website itself. Um, I also uh, pulled the enforcement box there to show that um, uh, the point is that the EPA is pretty serious about um, enforcing these regulations. And um, the, the fines and the consequences can be uh, pretty major um, if, uh, if there is a problem, and there are definitely consequences to that. I think the number is like $37,500 per day uh, potential there for a, for a, um, a noncompliance on that. Also, on that same website, I, I, I was interested in this one. This one I thought was a bit um, interesting in a different way. This is a... This is a, a story about a person that was uh, was actually stealing air conditioners, and um, they charged him with a violation of the Clean Air Act. Now, I suspect that that's probably the last thing that this individual would have been thinking about as he was um, as he was taking those air conditioners. And I, I guess the you know the lesson learned with all this too is that if you're going to steal air conditioners, you got to make sure that you're following the, the proper rules regarding the safe reclamation of refrigerants for that. So uh, something, to, um, something to be aware of there. So moving on um, to, uh, to Section 608 and what we're talking about with this, um, let's, uh, let's kind of go through the details. And again, this information was pulled from the fact sheets uh, and the references that are, that are down there at the bottom. So Section what well, we, we usually call it 608. It's actually part of the Clean Air Act that was uh, passed by Congress. Um, and then the EPA was authorized then to address um, uh, uh, parts of that. So 608 deals with or addresses stationary refrigeration. Set, uh, stationary refrigeration. Uh, incidentally, Section 609 actually addresses motor vehicle air conditioning. If you're wondering how those those things line up that way, um, the key elements of uh, 608 are, are listed there, and again around around the wheel. I won't go into tons of detail of them. Just really trying to make you aware of them, if you're not already, and would encourage you again to to, to uh, look at the references for the detail. But essentially, um, it, it uh, does not allow or pro prohibits the venting of refrigerant. Um, it requires technicians to be certified to work with um, uh, ozone depleting substances or refrigerants. Um, it um, also requires the safe disposal of those, as we, we talked about just a second ago. And it uh, implements and requires record keeping as you uh, replace those refrigerants. And of course, part of that record keeping is also the calculation of leak rates uh, um, to understand when the corrective actions need to be taken uh, take place. And so the last bullet there is, is really related to the corrective actions. Um, so if a leak rate uh, is calculated to be greater than 35 percent, then um, a, correct, a corrective action is mandated. Basically, you have to fix the leak. And there's some requirements around the timing and those kind of things, and certainly that's all in the regulations, and I would encourage you to, to kind of dig into those a little bit more. But, but those, are, those are the keys um, in terms of the existing um, uh, regulations that, that we have as part of 608. Now, a few years ago, um, California decided to create their own uh, set of regulations related to refrigerants. 
And so the California Air Resources Board, which is commonly referred to as uh, CARB, created what they call their um, the refrigerant, uh, refrigerant management plan. Uh, and the refrigerant management plan goes a bit further or maybe deeper, you might say, than 608 uh, in that it requires uh, periodic leak, leak inspections and, um, and follow-up actions in addition to the registration of the sites. So, um, so a little bit more uh, detail around what has to be done and, and how it has to be done. They also uh, introduced this concept of a c categorization of refrigeration systems um, based upon the size of the charge in the refrigerant system, refrigeration system. And um, the regulations are, are sort of tuned based upon uh, the size of the, the system and, and what it requires. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in, in just a second here, too. One of the key elements of interest for this presentation, anyway, for this web, uh, webinar, is that um, an automatic, automatic leak detection, or ALD, uh, which it's referred to in some of the literature, was, man was mandatory or may be mandatory, I should say, for um, certain large systems um, on, a, on a site. And again, we'll, we'll see a little bit more about that in just a second. Um, I know it sounds like a broken record, but I would encourage you again to, to take a look at that RMP link down there at the bottom. It's got a lot of really good information about it if you're interested in it um, and knowing the details of this. So I, uh, I pulled out from the guidance document that uh, had been prepared uh, by CARB a couple of things that I thought would be pertinent and interesting for our presentation here. Um, and that's uh, uh, really a, 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 a little bit more information on automatic leak detection systems. So um, basically, an automated, uh, automated leak detection system may be required for large systems. And remember, large is classified as 2,000 pounds of refrigerant uh, under certain conditions. And you'll see in that, in that box it talks about if the system's indoors or outdoors, um, if it's indoors, uh, it must have an, uh, an ALD. And then uh, the other thing that's kind of interesting, too, is the, um, the uh, IE compressors, evaporator condenser, uh, evaporators and condensers, was uh, in line with the uh, information about, um, you know, where are the leaks in that previous slide that was presented as well. So I think there's, there's some alignment for that part as well. Um, the other thing to note is, um, is there's two different types of automatic leak detectors that are, are acceptable uh, by CARB. Uh, a direct type, which I suspect is what most people might be aware of, and that's um, essentially a, a piece of hardware on site whose, really whose, whose function is to uh, sample the air and, and uh, look for refrigeration in the air itself. And uh, there's an indirect type that uh, essentially looks at the operation of the system itself to infer, infer that there's a leak or, or not a leak. And I've got a little, uh, I got more information about the direct versus in, indirect uh, a little bit later in the presentation. So if you're not familiar with those, we'll certainly be, I'll be providing you more information and background on what those systems are as well. Um, I guess the, the key point here on this slide is to remember that for some facilities, uh, automatic leak detection is required. And then it can also offset. Remember, one of the um, one of the the uh, regulations or one of the elements of it was to require um, inspections, regular inspections, depending upon the size of the system. And as it turns out, um, the automatic leak detectors installed could could actually offset the need to do some of those uh, required leak inspections. So good to keep that in mind as you think about um, how you might use uh, leak detection systems as part of your your overall program. So we've covered what's uh, in force today and, and some of the regulations today, but recently the EPA announced that they were proposing an update to Section uh, 608. Um, now, the full details of uh, Section 608 or the proposed update are in that reference shown at the bottom. It's a, it's a pretty large document. It's a little over 300 pages. Um, I would encourage you to, to uh, look at it, though, to, again, familiarize yourself with it, especially the first uh, 20 or 30 pages or so kind of give you uh, uh, the idea about the gist of, the, of what's going on. I wouldn't, uh, you know, you can read it all, but, but that's where a lot of the meat is covered at in that part. The other thing I want to do is, is stress that this is really a proposed um, update to the regulations at this point. It's not a final rule. 
And um, for those of you that are familiar with the way the rulemaking process works, um, a publication like this, uh, a proposal is published, and it essentially starts a process where public comments uh, can be made and reviewed um, and looked at, and then at the end of the comment process, um, the regulatory body, in this case the EPA, can decide what elements of it need to change or if they want to accept it and those kind of things. So, again, it's, it's really impossible to say what the final rule will look like. Um, the best that you can do is look at the proposed uh, sections and then try to make sure that you understand those and are setting yourself up um, to, to know or to, know, to take the right action should those be, uh, become uh, the, the, the actual rule. Um, so this slide, it goes into a little bit more detail, and if, if you look at the fact sheet, uh, again, the references at the bottom, you can see some of the areas where the, uh, the update or the, the updated proposal to 608 is, is looking at. Um, and uh, you'll notice if you read that fact sheet, I pretty much used it word for word on this slide to try to make sure I capture, you know, the essence of, uh, of the proposal itself. Uh, the first point is that um, the, uh, the, the trigger point uh, where leaks must be repaired um, is being lowered, or the proposal is to lower the trigger point from 35% to 20% uh, for commercial refrigeration. So that is, uh, that's the first uh, key. Uh, the second one is that uh, similar to CARB and what we saw a few minutes ago, the proposal also uh, requires or will require uh, regular leak inspections or continuous automated monitoring devices. Um, and that is, um, that's slightly different than, than uh, the CARB regulations uh, because uh, if you look at the proposal, they're, again, they're encouraging automated monitoring or the, leak uh, the regular leak inspections themselves. So, again, just another way that you could use an automated leak detector to cut down on those uh, regular inspections that way. Um, the, the next uh, bullet point talks about uh, chronic uh, systems that have chronic leaks that leak uh, more than 75% of their charge for two years. Essentially, it would prohibit um, using those systems. Um, and then there's, there's other elements that are important. Uh, they deal with uh, the re some of the reporting changes and then also extending the requirements to uh, substitute uh, refrigerants such as HFCs. So all in all, again, the, the the proposed rule is 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 pretty encompassing in, in what it uh, does and the changes that it makes, but I would caution again that it, it's proposed. It's not final, and um, at this point, it's difficult to tell what or how it may become final. So I would uh, I would encourage you to you know keep up with the EPA's websites, look at the comments, so that you can uh, keep up with the changes as they're being um, as they're being discussed and talked about there. So uh, with that, let's, let's take our next poll question, uh, which really is kind of drilling down just a little bit on leak detection systems uh, in general. And before I read the question to you, I wanted to give you one uh, quick um, explanation here. Fixed leak detection systems, uh, I define them as systems that are permanently mounted at a location or at a store, for instance, whereas portable leak detection systems are brought um, on site as needed. So in other words, that may be that a technician brings a, a leak detector with him to either do an inspection or try to determine where a leak is or something like that. So that's the difference between fixed and portable. The question is, do you currently use leak detection systems as part of your refrigeration management plan? And I've got four possible answers to that question. Uh, no, you do not use uh, leak detection systems at all. Yes, you use fixed systems, uh, yes, you use portable systems only, or yes, you use both fixed and permanent, or, or and portable, I'm sorry, uh, as needed, P portable as needed. So um, I would ask you to go ahead and uh, lock your answers in, and then just make sure that you uh, click the submit button, and we'll, we'll give it a, a few minutes here to, to give you a chance to go through those, those, uh, those questions. And then while we're uh, waiting on the poll results to come back, I'll go ahead and uh, introduce the next part of the, um, of the discussion. So the next thing we're going to talk about is what are the key elements um, or what key elements should a refrigerant leak detection program include. So I'm going to give you a little bit of 
of information there related to what those elements actually are. And I'm going to pause for just a couple seconds here, and we'll let the uh, answers to the poll come back. And it looks like they have come back, and um, uh, some, uh, this is uh, some good information here. So it looks like about 36%, um, so that's the highest percentage, use both fixed and portable systems as needed. That's great. That's very good. Um, a fairly high percentage, 30% next highest use portable. Um, and then um, uh, no is 17% and permanently installed is 14% by itself. So good. Uh, that's, a, that's a very interesting uh, spread between those different answers. And then hopefully as we go through the presentation here, I can provide you some info that uh, would convince you that if you're not using the fixed systems today, it would uh, it would be a really good idea to uh, start applying those as part of your, your uh, leak detection program overall. So let's look at um, the, uh, the elements, uh, uh, what, what you think about a, a leak detection program and some of the key elements. Now, you may have already created a program or you're thinking about creating a program, and, and that's great. I, I do applaud you for that. Um, I'll try to add just a little bit more. This is sort of my spin on things and my thought thoughts here, so maybe you'll pick up, if you already have a program in place, maybe you, you pick up uh, an, an item or two that might be helpful for you. Um, I'm also making the assumption here that you, um, you're you looking to create or have a, a leak detection program, not just to respond to leaks, but really to be more proactive um, about minimizing or reducing those, those leaks altogether. So that's one of the assumptions that I make. So if we start um, at the very bottom of the chart there, the, the, when, I, when I think about it, the, the detection piece is the first element of um, thinking about or creating your, your leak detection program. And the detection is where, to me, sort of the, you know, the, I guess you said the rubber meets the road, or that, that's really a, a key element because that uh, defines how you know that a leak is occurring. Uh, and as part of that, um, you know, what technologies are available for, for doing that? We're going to talk a little bit about that in, in the next sec uh, section as well to give you a little bit more um, air, uh, uh, background information there. Um, the other part of the detection piece is where do, you know, how do I install the leak detectors and where do I install the, lo the location? And again, I'll sort of ask you to remember back um, in the, um, you know, that Pareto chart that showed where are the leaks at, uh, that hopefully will provide you some guidance as far as uh, where the, the uh, detectors should be installed at. So once you've got the detectors installed, you've got that, that bottom layer, the detection part covered. Um, now the next layer up is, is uh, the, what I've called the notification layer. So the notification layer really ensures that someone uh, knows that a leak has occurred. In other words, your detector detects that. Your notification is how, who do you detect, how do you ta uh, detect it, or who do you, who, who's taken action on it, and those kind of things. And it can be a uh, local alarm, um, can also be a, a remote uh, alarm, or, or perhaps maybe it's, it's both. Now, generally the remote alarming is uh, usually, but not always, some kind of connection uh, to an energy management system that can push those alarms out to um, either a technician or some kind of monitoring center to make sure that they're um, handled and managed in the, uh, in the correct way. Um, I suspect or I would recommend you sort of look at um, maybe a combination of both of those uh, if you don't have any, any plan in place at, at this point. And then finally, um, the way I think about it is you're generating lots of data out of those notifications. You know, you're detecting leaks, you're doing your notification, um, actions are being taken. But there's another layer on top of that that maybe we might forget about sometimes. Um, and that's really to, to kind of take that data that's being generated and make sure that you're using it in the best available way. And what I would say is, you know, looking at recording the events that occur, um, maybe correlating um, the events or the leaks with uh, the different types of, of equipment, um, identifying, you know, maybe areas to focus on, areas to uh, to uh, apply some, some more, you know, potentially more inspections, those kind of things, and, and, and also um, understanding the overall impact to your, your business as well. So really, the, you know, the key part of that is to, to really take that data that's being created or being generated 
And don't just, you know, do the, okay, I'm going to fix that leak. Really sort of use that as part of your general analysis around that that can help you pinpoint some areas that will really uh, help to drive your your leak rates uh, down and minimize your your uh, your uh, uh, leaks in general that way. Um, I wanted to, to pull together and include a few best practices uh, that you also might think about incorporating into your, your program if you haven't already in, incorporated these. Um, and the first one is to ensure or make sure that everyone in your organization knows that finding and minimizing leaks is really important, and they're, um, uh, it's, you know, it's really sort of part of everybody's job, I guess. Uh, one of the things you might consider doing is uh, thinking about that impact uh, chart that I used um, that uh, was part of the E360 that showed the refrigerant cost and those kind of things, and, and update that as, you know, kind of plug your numbers in and update it and use it um, to show the organization not only the financial impact, but the environmental impact as well, and a few others uh, like that. <clears throat> so that is um, about the, the policy uh, that you use and, and make sure that it's really kind of driven down throughout all levels of the organization. Uh, the next one, we've talked about using the automated leak detectors uh, to identify leaks and then use that data as part of your analytics program, um, again, pinpointing sites and equipment causing the most problems and, and uh, apply some focused effort in those those areas um, to help uh, address that, and, and I think it'll pay dividends. Certainly, proper maintenance uh, procedures uh, are very important. And then um, finally, uh, there's uh, lots of uh, links. I, I mentioned this a couple of times now that have been included, uh, and I would certainly encourage you to utilize those and others uh, as part of your education program within your organizations as well. The other thing, uh, it's not really on the chart, but the other thing to, to remind you is um, when you look uh, especially at the current uh, uh, regulations for CARB and, and the proposals, uh, it could be that an automated uh, leak detection system could really help you reduce the need to do your inspections uh, as well. So that's a, another you know, important piece not to forget overall. Um, as I was putting the, this presentation together, uh, one of the things I, I wanted to, to, to show or to, to to, to uh, put some information out was that there really is a benefit to detecting uh, leaks early. And so, um, so I, I thought this chart uh, did a pretty good job of kind of showing uh, the impact uh, that grows over time. And just to explain the chart, the, uh, the y-axis represents uh, the total amount of refrigerant loss um, versus time. So the x-axis in this case is, is time. So you can sort of think of it overall as, as what happens if I have a small, slow leak that starts way over on that left-hand side, but it goes undetected for a long period of time. And that's the way that I would, I would look at this chart. So most refrigeration systems, if you start over there on the left-hand side, most refrigeration systems are designed with enough uh, excess capacity that a, a small refrigerant leak will just kind of get masked. Um, it really won't have much of an effect overall. Uh, it won't, it's kind of hard to detect unless you're specifically looking for it with some kind of leak detection equipment or, you know, doing an inspection or something like that. <clears throat> so that's the, uh, the far left, the yellow area. Now, as you pass into the middle part of that or over time, as more of that refrigerant leaks out, that excess capacity that, that was originally present in the system it's kind of used up, um, so uh, the performance of the system starts to degrade at that point, and uh, that's where you can start seeing potentially an energy penalty depending upon uh, the conditions and those kind of things, and it can start really costing you money. That's also the area where you could potentially pick up that leak by looking at, you know, liquid level alarms and some relatively um, simple alarming uh, uh, procedures around that as well. Finally, once uh, let's just say that the system keeps leaking that small leak and you're losing more and more refrigerant, you get to the right-hand side of that chart, uh, which is, is the red part, and that's the point where the system really just can't keep up. Um, maybe it's a, it's a you know ambient conditions, a really hot day, uh, could be uh, worst case you know a critical day for shopping and something like that, and that's where you'll finally see temperature alarms that would come out. So your case temperatures, the system just can't maintain. Um, but the problem is, by that point, you know, you've wasted a lot of money 
you've leaked a lot of refrigerant into the uh, into the air, and potentially you might have some product issues as well, because the system's really not holding temperature at that point. So that that sort of shows you how a small leak, if you just let it go and assume it's not going to be a problem, it can have a big impact over over time. And so one of the things I would encourage you is. You know, look to find those those leaks early, and don't don't let them just kind of set there because eventually they will become a much bigger problem, um, as you see from from the chart itself. All right, so that brings us uh, to our our next uh, question. I think this is probably the last poll uh, question that that we have. Um, and um, what I'd like to do is understand a little bit more about how familiar you are with the different types of leak detection systems. So, um, so the question is, are you familiar with different types of leak detection systems and understand how to apply the, the technologies? Um, um, and by the way, direct in this case means uh, hardware on site. Indirect means, um, uh, as we talked about on the carb slide, uh, some kind of sensing system, things like that. So the, there's four answers, no, somewhat. Yes, you're familiar with direct, meaning, again, some kind of dedicated hardware installed on site. And yes, you're familiar with both direct and indirect systems. So um, I'll pause just a, a few seconds here for you to submit your your answers. And again, please uh, select your your answer and press the submit button to make sure it gets counted. So while we're we're waiting, oh, it looks like we've already got the the uh, the questions here. So that's great. Uh, let's take a look at this. It looks like. Um, about, um, excuse me, 22% um, of the respondents are familiar with both direct and indirect systems. That's great. That's that's good. Um, about 17% uh, are familiar with direct, so that's uh, it's a little bit less, but that's uh, I, I can understand that. Um, no is 13%, so just a few few people or a few uh, small percentage is not familiar at all. And the vast majority in either case are somewhat. So hopefully what you'll find as we introduce and talk about the next topic is you'll be able to answer that question. Yes, you're familiar with both direct and indirect if I answer if I were to ask that question um, again after the presentation. So let me introduce um, uh, the last topic here, and I want to spend a few minutes talking a bit more about the different technologies to help you as part of a leak detection program. Um, uh, uh, overall. Um, so when I think about it, I tend to think in terms of, of visuals when I'm trying to understand, you know, uh, a lot of different categories and things like that. So I think in terms of uh, visuals, you know, lots of drawings, pretty pictures, bright colors, although these aren't so bright, and, you know, that, those kind of things. So I created this graphic that, that helps me to kind of categorize, categorize and think through the different types of uh, leak detection technologies. Uh, first, um, if we start at the, the top, uh, on the left-hand side over there, directly under the leak detection, is, is two, two main types of technologies, direct and indirect. And uh, we've sort of referred to that, um, or I've referred to that in the presentation. There was a little bit about it in the card literature, and then I've talked a little bit about it. So we're going to drill down just a little bit more. But if we stay on the left-hand side of that chart and look at direct technologies, you can think of it as either fixed, um, meaning those are technologies that are, you know, some kind of hardware that is permanently mounted at a site, uh, or as uh, portable. And uh, portable would be something that you bring with you to the site. A technician would generally bring, generally bring it in as part of a, trying to isolate a leak or perhaps as part of an inspection or something like that. So one level down, uh, we have fixed and then portable. And then if you sort of, uh, if you drill down on the fixed side over there, there's a couple of basic technologies that um, the detectors can have as well. And I've labeled those uh, active and passive, and, and we'll get into uh, to the details of those uh, in just a little bit here. <clears throat> the one thing I would note is that um, all uh, of the direct leak detectors have a dedicated piece of hardware on site. Um, so that's sort of the general trait of those. Um, and they, uh, you know, that hardware's only purpose really is to detect the refrigerant leaks by sampling the air, by sampling the refrigerant gases in the air themselves. So if you go over to the other side, the indirect, and again, we'll talk about it in more detail in just a little bit here, but on the indirect side, there's generally no dedicated hardware on site. Um, 
it, th th those tend to look more, the indirect systems uh, will look more at how a system is performing to infer that uh, a leak is occurring uh, in, in the system. All right, so if we, we drill down just a little bit on uh, the characteristics of those um, uh, leak detection technologies, and one of the things on the left-hand side, I've included the, uh, the active and passive, that's the, that's the direct. Um, the, uh, I also wanted to say that active and passive doesn't really imply anything uh, related to the performance or anything like that. It's just the way that I differentiate be between those two. Um, active detectors generally have a, a central unit that um, takes samples of the air to determine if there's uh, any uh, refrigerant gases present in the air itself. Generally, they can support multiple zones or multiple areas and they do this by uh, you, you, by running uh, some type of tubing, generally some kind of plastic tubing or something like that, to those different areas and then connect them back to the central unit. And then the central unit itself uh, rotates through those different areas, areas pulling a sample of that, uh, the air in that surrounds that, the end of the tube. There's generally a little filter on the end of the tube itself. And then it does the uh, calculation. It samples that, that's that particular zone or area to see if there are any gases present in that area. Uh, passive detectors, on the other hand, they don't have any tubing, um, and generally they are placed in the area where the sensing is desired. Um, so the advantage to those sensors are there's no moving parts, uh, so generally there's less maintenance required with those. Um, um, on the plus side, on the, on the minus side, the, the, they can be a bit more expensive overall especially if you're sampling a lot of different areas uh, in a location. So uh, I think there's probably a, a need or a place for both of those, but that is the basic difference between the two. Um, active detectors um, are installed with tubing back to a central unit. Passive detectors uh, tend to be electrically connected to some type of um, uh, energy management system or something like that directly. Now, I will say both active and passive det uh, detectors in general, are connected uh, to an energy management system for the notification re remote monitoring purposes, uh, like we talked about a few minutes ago. And then, of course, you saw on the CARB slide, you know, both can be used as part of the uh, automatic leak detection uh, requirements or uh, to help reduce the inspection frequency uh, for, uh, for CARB. Um, the indirect detection is a little bit different. I've shown it on the right-hand side there. Um, and Generally, it uses existing sensors um, and, and, you know, hardware that's on the site. Um, uh, essentially, there's, there's an algorithm that looks at the system conditions, could be pressures, temperatures, liquid levels, ambient conditions, those kind of things, uh, runs some type of analysis or algorithm on that to analyze the data. And then decides um, if uh, if a leak is occurring or not occurring based upon the the analysis of those system parameters at that particular time. And there's also an element of historical or trending uh, that comes into that as well. Now, when you think about that again, it you know it doesn't require any additional sensors or anything like that. <clears throat> the other the other um, maybe advantage of the indirect method is. Uh, it's not sensitive to the location of the sensors either. So when we talked a few minutes ago about the active and the passive, uh, both of those methods, the direct methods, require you to place either the tubing uh, or the sensor itself where you expect that leak to occur. And then further, um, it also requires or uh, the air movement or the, the air around the refrigerant uh, as it comes into the air sometimes disperses so that can affect those levels at which you can pick up a refrigerant. Now, the advantage of the indirect method is none of that really matters. Um, it's not location sensitive, um, so it, um, it, is, it doesn't matter what the air movement is in the area or anything like that. So that is an advantage for it. The one, uh, say, disadvantage might be that it, um, it can't pinpoint a, uh, the exact location of the leak. Um, so, in other words, if you have, you know, one of the direct sensors and you have a sensor at that location and it fires on that particular area or zone or that particular um, passive sensor, then you, you know the general area that that leak occurred. Uh, you don't necessarily have that method or have that, that information with the indirect method. 
So for that reason, you know, you might want to think about maybe uh, using a combination of those in some combination to kind of help you not only be able to sense when that leak is occurring, um, the indirect method will give you that information, but also where that might be or the general area it might be. Again, your individual situation, it depends, but um, what I'm trying to do is give you some, uh, some ideas about different ways to look at things overall. Now, I, uh, I've included, um, I think the indirect, and I think the poll results probably, probably showed that just a little bit here. The indirect method may be a little less familiar to people. Uh, and so one of the things I thought I'd do is, is pull, uh, pull a, a chart or a, an example of that. And this actually comes from um, one of the, the uh, products that, uh, that we have, uh, part of our, our leak detection uh, product line. Uh, and it shows uh, how that algorithm works. Uh, over, overall. So this particular algorithm we're talking about here, it, it essentially creates a, a model of what it expects the um, or predicts that the, the refrigerant level uh, should be at any particular time, and it bases that on historical trend data, um, and then it looks at, at the, the actuals. Uh, so it's looking at the system conditions as they are currently, um, you know, factoring in ambient and other conditions. And then it compares that to what the actual receiver levels are. And then based upon that, it can decide if there is, uh, is a leak or not. And so if you look at it sort of on the left-hand side of that, that chart, um, you can see the blue line is what the model pre is the predicted refrigerant level. Uh, so that's what the model predicts. And then the, the brown line is um, what the actual refrigerant level was. And so... The, the system picked that up uh, pretty early on that there was there was a deviation or, or the predictive versus actual was uh, was separating and so at that point we knew that that there was something happening a refrigerant leak had been detected now in this case we were letting it run just to see when uh, when other you know when it might be picked up and then we could also pick up when um, the refrigerant was added back in. So a technician came in, perhaps it got to the far side of that chart in the red area on my slow, you know, small leaks become big problems chart a few charts back. And the technician in this case um, added refrigerant back into it, and you can see how that the predicted uh, refrigerant level then came back up, or the actual refrigerant level then came back up to match the predicted uh, refrigerant level. So again, just an example that shows you um, the, the way that that algorithm works and how that technology can be used uh, overall. So, uh, so I'm, I'm uh, I guess uh, we're running up on time here, so I'll kind of uh, hit my last couple slides here. This is the uh, last slide, and I just really wanted to summarize some of the key takeaways from the presentation. And that is, uh, first of all, you know, leaks can occur anywhere, uh, but the data shows that racks and cases are, are pretty major contributors to that. So don't ignore those, and if you have to make a choice, you know, do your inspections look really hard in, in those areas. Um, I would uh, ask you to do your own math, use those calculators, and, and figure out what the impact is on your own organization um, uh, based upon your leak rates and the information you have. And use that in your training materials uh, and your leak detection program to show the importance to others. Um, there's new, uh, there's existing regulations, and there's new proposals. Um, make sure you use the resources to uh, familiarize yourself with those. You know, get your legal team involved, uh, and you know, contact EPA and, and CARB directly to figure out and determine what the the impact is to you. Um, there's good resources, use it, uh, and then finally, um, look at the different technologies. You know, I've tried to give you a, a pretty high-level overview of those different technologies that are available, but they can help you find leaks, and potentially uh, those type of the technologies that we talked about can uh, offset the need to do some regular inspections that are uh, either mandated or potentially mandated um, as part of some of the regulations. So, um, so different ways to look at that, but I would certainly encourage you to, to use automatic leak detection as well. So as promised, this is the, uh, this is the information. Again, this is available uh, from the webinar itself, so um, please take advantage of it. I've tried to give you the links to general references. Certainly the E360 website is there in the Emerson Climate. Uh, then also the bottom section are specific links to the references used within this presentation itself. So finally, I really appreciate your time today. I thank you very much for listening in. Um, hopefully provided some good information to you, something that you can 
utilize as you go back and uh, either implement a program or seek to improve your, your leak detection uh, programs themselves. I would love to uh, answer questions. Feel free to email or call me and uh, be happy to, to work with you and try to answer any specific questions that you, uh, you might have. And I know we're pretty tight here, but we may have time. I don't know. Uh, Alan, do we have time for maybe one or two really quick questions here? Yeah, John, we do. Uh, just uh, appreciate the information there. Uh, the question and answer portion of our event is about to begin. As a reminder, to participate in the Q&A, click on the question mark icon located in the floating toolbar at the edge of your screen and type in your question into the text area. Hit send. Please keep the send to default set as all panelists. First question I have, John, um, is the weight limit an individual unit weight limit or a cumulative weight uh, limit for a specific site or site function? Ah, that's a good question. So um, uh, the, the, the CARB, uh, if you go to the RMP um, section, refrigerant management plan section on the CARB uh, website, uh, it, uh, it, it says that for classification of your site, in other words, small, medium, or large, you have to look at the, the cumulative itself, even though um, a particular system may be small or medium, medium or whatever. It's, it's actually, I'm sorry, it's not cumulative. It's the largest system that's in place for that particular site. So that is a little bit tricky. That's a, that's a really good question. Um, again, the, the CARB has some, some good information on that. And then uh, in the proposal itself, it will also drill down a bit on that and, and give you that information as well. All right, good. I think we probably have time for one more here. On the portable leak detectors, which type is most effective, and would you recommend one? Uh, I will. I will not recommend one. I, I'm. In, this is you know non-commercial presentation, so I don't want to recommend one one necessary brand over the other. Um, the thing I would just I would say is is um, you have to find something that that kind of works for your technicians. I think there's there's lots of trade-offs with that. Um, I would. I, I've seen some of the literature from some of the major uh, manufacturers out there, and there's some very interesting new technologies that they have. Uh, those are all, of course, direct uh, direct sensing uh, with that, and that would be my recommendation. I, I'd, I'd advise you to follow up with the manufacturers of those portable leak detectors uh, for their particular recommendations. Uh, I don't have a, a recommendation for one in particular. All right, I think we're coming up on the time limit here. We're a little bit past 3 o'clock. Um, as a reminder, uh, thanks for your time, uh, for all your questions today. Thanks for your participation. Within approximately 24 hours after this live event, you can access the presentation on demand at emersoncliment.com backslash e360-webinars. And you'll also receive an email in the next couple of days with a link to the recorded event. On behalf of Emerson Climate Technologies, thank you for attending today's E360 webinar. Information and registration will be available soon for our next webinar. We hope you can join us again. Thank you very much for joining. You may now disconnect.